So welcome to part two of episode one. Now, in the previous episode, I talked about the fact that, again, I came to a certain point in my life where I became a hoper, a hoper that the rapture was true, but I planned for the worst. What if it wasn't true? And it was all based upon the chaos and disagreement among those who were supposedly end-time scholars. And they were devout Christians, devout believers. And the disagreement was just lend, lend itself to, to, to such chaos. And sometimes the disagreement was in such angry terms, I couldn't believe it. Now, the second thing in the first session, I talked about getting my master's degree in Bible history and talked about the fact that one class that I took called Hebrew Language Bible Study Skills was probably one of the most significant classes that I have ever taken in my life. Again, because Jesus spoke Hebrew and not Aramaic. I talked about the book, again, understanding the difficult words of Jesus. And again, like I said, there are other uh, links that I'm sharing with you. So if you go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org, find this session, find this vidcast, look underneath the picture, and you'll find those links so that you can study the concept of Jesus speaking Hebrew. So my graduate studies helped me with the idea of studying the Bible by putting it in its historical context and allowed me to be able to use scholarly tools. And I talked about Thayer's Greek lexicon and also Gesenius, Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, and many amazing free tools that are available on the internet that we need for really serious Bible study from a scholarly approach. And I was able to take the Greek and take it to the Hebrew so I could understand what Jesus was really saying in the Hebrew. I remember, oh, I was doing research, uh, probably study for another topic, but for some reason I bumped into a, again, end time scholar, and they were talking about the pre-trib concept uh, of the rapture. And they were using this text, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Reading from the New American Standard. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. What I found interesting is this group of pre-trib rapturists were saying that this verse proved unequivocally that the rapture is pre-trib. I couldn't believe it. Because then I found rapturists who were mid-trib and rapturists who were post-trib who also used the same verse. Remember what I said in session one? that they were using the truth to come against the truth, that they were using the very words of God to come to get to come against the very words of God. And so what we have, these three groups, three groups who disagree with each other on the meaning of these verses. Now, what's very interesting is I have not come across one so-called end times Bible expert, not one who actually understands the Hebrew, understands the Greek, understands the culture and the historical context of when Jesus said this verse. 
And that's what I did. I put the verse into its historical context. And I wanted to understand the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. Now, when you do this, it seems that there is an alternative interpretation to the rapture. And for me, it made sense. And it blew me away. Let me take you through this. And yes, I believe this is an, al an, alternative inter an alternative interpretation. And it's not based upon my opinion. It's based upon real archaeology, the customs and culture of Jesus' day, and the very words of God. Now, when Jesus said this, you can check it out, Matthew 24. He was teaching his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives, he taught them. These words, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Now, he taught his disciples. Now, what does that mean? Because when he ascended to his father on Ascension Thursday, there were 120 disciples. So was it just the 12 that were with him on the Mount of Olives, or were there more? Were there 10, 20, 30 more of the 120? We don't know. All we know is that his disciples were with him. There could have been four or five. There could have been 20, maybe all 120. Who knows? The only Bible that they had in Jesus' day was the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Old Testament. The disciples who heard Jesus' words, were religious Jews. So, therefore, if the only Bible they had was the Old Testament, matter of fact, I deal with one great, credible archaeologist, a biblical archaeologist, Randall Price, and I remember in his video that's available on YouTube. It's an hour and a half on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He starts out in his introduction talking about what was the Bible in Jesus' day, the Old Testament. There was no New Testament written. So what did his Jewish disciples who were practicing Judaism, Second Temple Judaism here, now one word that they heard in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, is they heard the concept of the elect. That Jesus was going to come and he was going to gather in his elect. Now the Hebrew is Bachir. And the Strong's number is H972. Because it comes from the Greek eklektas. That's what you find in the Greek of the New Testament. And that Greek word, elektras, its Strong's number is G1588. Bachir means the same thing as elektas, God's chosen. Now, we see this in Isaiah 45.4. In Isaiah 45.4, we read, For the sake of Jacob, my servant, Jacob is just another name for Israel, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, Bahir, my chosen, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Another one happens to be a Psalm 89, verse 3. And in Psalm 89, verse 3, we read, I have made a covenant with my chosen, Bahir. I have sworn to David my servant. So, 2,000 years ago, they hear Jesus saying, Bahir, and they know what Jesus is saying. Bahir is Israel. These, these guys are educated. They went to school at least until they're 12 years old. And, and their textbook was the Old Testament. 
they had so much of the Bible memorized at age 12. It puts us to shame. So for them, Bahir, it means Israel. They are the chosen people. Now, the second thing that they heard in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, is the Hebrew phrase, Kevar Enash, Kevar Enash, or son of man. Now, in Jesus' day, the concept of son of man, which we can find in Daniel 7, verse 13, and definitely in the book of Enoch, which is not a biblical book, but was available in Jesus' day, that the son of man refers to the Messiah. So I put up the book of Enoch, chapter 46, verses 1 through 4 on the screen. And you can stop the video at any time and be able to read that. Scholars say that these verses are even stronger in terms of their association with the coming Messiah than even Daniel. So when we put this into its historical context, what are these Jews hearing, these disciples? Whether it be five of the disciples, all 12, or all 120, they heard the Messiah was coming, Jesus. He was coming for his elect, the Son of Man, because Jesus said that he is the Son of Man. If I recall, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, which means, as far as the culture is concerned 2,000 years ago, he's basically saying, I'm the Messiah. He says that well, well over 50 or 60 times. You can check that out. So this was not anything new in Jesus' day. The Lord, Yahweh is his name, predicted this saving of Israel, his elect, time and time again in the Hebrew scriptures. Let's consider this. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 5. And we read, So it shall be, when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So we read about the fact that indeed the Lord is going to gather his elect. This is in Deuteronomy. We heard the word gather. The Hebrew word there is kabatz. We also see this in Isaiah Chapter 11, verses 11 through 12. And we read, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamad, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up the standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And another verse we find it also is in Jeremiah 23, verse 3. Then I myself will gather. Chabatz. We read that in, in the book of Isaiah. It's the same Hebrew word that we found in Deuteronomy 30. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful, and they will multiply. But the disciples knew this. They knew in Jewish eschatology of that time that this prediction by God in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and a number of other places, that it was going to happen. It was going to happen at the last shofar blast. It is called 
the ingathering of the exiles. The ingathering of Israel. Now Jesus, in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, he uses the word gather. The Greek word that's used there is episunago. Episunago. And it's G1996. He also uses the word trumpet. Greek word is salpinx, trumpet. Greek, the Strong's number is G4535. Now, using Thayer's Greek lexicon, we find that epi sunago is used to translate the word, the Hebrew word, kabatz, in the Septuagint, to gather. This is exactly what we read in Deuteronomy, in Isaiah, and in Jeremiah. The prediction by God that in the end times, he would gather Israel. So the Lord, his name is Yahweh. At the last great sound of the trumpet, the Greek word there is salpinx. And salpinx, which is the Strong's number, G4535, translates the word shofar. This is exactly what it was like in Jesus' day. At the last great shofar, the Lord, Yahweh, is going to gather in his elect, Israel, at the end times and make sure that they dwell in the land forever with no enemies anymore. So when we take Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, and put it in historical perspective. Remember, there is no New Testament. Not for years. All they had was the Hebrew Bible. The Old Testament. Jesus verifies the predictions that are in the Torah and in the prophets. He verifies them. And he's not teaching anything new. With one exception. And the difference is huge. Remember, Jesus says a number of times, like I said in Mark, it's 50 or 60 times, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, which means the Messiah from the book of Daniel and the book of Enoch. This is what he was saying. So when we read Matthew 24, 24 through 31, the disciples are saying, wait a minute. Jesus is the one because he calls himself the son of man. He is going to gather in his elect. But when we read in the Hebrew scriptures, it's God who does it. So what is going on? Jesus just said that he's God. The Jewish disciples, they heard Jesus' words. It wasn't anything they haven't heard before, with the exception that in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, it's always God, Yahweh, gathering in his elect. And now Jesus is saying, I, the Son of Man, will gather in the elect at the last shofar. This fits Jewish eschatology perfectly. And Jesus just declared himself God, probably on the day before or maybe two days before his crucifixion. This is foundational to Jewish eschatology. Jesus is reaffirming the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in the Jewish culture of those days meant one thing and one thing only, not a place, not a castle, not a time period. The kingdom of God was the rule and reign of God. God is king. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is among you. And when you take a look at the Greek and you go to the Hebrew, it's an intimate closeness. We do not have an English word that even helps us understand the concept of the kingdom of God is close to you. It's such an intimate closeness. It affects you so deeply, body, mind, and spirit. 
Jesus is king. And the kingdom of God, because of Jesus, who is king, is among us. So he promised to gather his elect. He said it in the Old Testament. Now he's saying it now, which will be recorded in the book of Matthew. No. Perhaps one might call this the rapture. God is going to gather his people from all of the pagan nations and bring them back to their land? Now, if one studies Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 5, we go back to verse 4. And in verse 4, it says, If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there, he will bring you back. So depending on the Bible version you have, New American Standard says, bring you back. King James says, take you back. Or fetch you back. ESV is take you back. We need to take a look at the Hebrew word. Again, we don't study the Hebrew. The Hebrew word there for bring for fetch to take is lachach. Strong's number is H3947. It means to take, to carry away, to fetch. And in some cases, it can mean to capture, to seize, or to take by force. Now, lakach is almost like a synonym of the Greek Greek word that's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So we come to that word <laughs> caught up. The Greek word there is harpazo. The Strong's number is G726. And harpazo when we take a look at Thayer's Greek lexicon, means to seize, to carry off by force, to snatch. Harpazo is almost like a synonym of lachach that we read in Deuteronomy 30. Now, the word harpazo in Latin is rapio, and that's where we get the word rapture. Now, what's very interesting is this. In the Latin, rapio basically means the same thing as harpazo, to seize, to take by force, to carry off quickly. When we take a look at the modern definition of rapture, it means bliss, ecstasy. So when people say to me, rapture is in the Bible, it can't be. Rapio is not rapture to be very clear in terms of the meaning of words. Now, to me, all of this was beginning to make sense. It seems that the Lord, his plan, is can be traced all the way back to the days of Moses. Perhaps we're seeing that indeed, that the rapture is restored. Restored to what God really meant by 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. It's restored to its historical context. And seemingly most, if not all, the so-called end times Bible experts completely ignore. Not one have I heard. And I, I ask you to communicate with me. Email me. I would like to know if there is a scholar out there who has actually taken the verse, Matthew 24, 
29 through 31 and put it to its historical context and actually study the Hebrew and the Greek. I have not found one. So we're done with episode one. You need to study this in more depth. Next, we're going to go to the city of Thessalonica. And some say, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17 is the first time the rapture is taught. From what we've seen <laughs> so far, we would have to say perhaps it wasn't. So I'm going to see you in episode two. We'll continue to study the rapture restored. The ingathering of Israel. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50, that Jesus lifted up his hands and he blessed them. He probably blessed his disciples with the ironic blessing. <laughs> Jesus is our high priest. And so we're going to end our session. And then we're going to ask him to bless us. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. We'll let our high priest actually use the exact words. We'll use it as a prayer. Yevarek enu Adonai veshmarkenu. Yair Adonai panav aleinu. Vekunakenu. Yisa Adonai panav aleinu. Viasem lanu shalom. Beshem Yeshua Adonainu. Amen. Please pray the English with me as we end our session. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus our Lord, Amen.